1973, Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, Don Kay, and Brian Bloom formed the partnership Tactical Studies Rules, known as TSR. In January of 1974, they would publish their first three books for Dungeons & Dragons, sold as a set in the classic wood grain box. The first three books were called Men and Magic, Monsters and Treasure, and Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. They would sell out of their handmade stock in less than a year. Welcome. I am Justin, and you are listening to Dungeon Chat, our very own Into the Dungeon bi-weekly podcast where we discuss the most recent live stream, interview our players and DMs, and discuss tabletop RPG news. In this episode, we are joined by Megan and Patrick. Megan did a fantastic job dungeon mastering our Halloween special last Sunday. She is also a player in our main game and is one of the three artists responsible for the Into the Dungeon logo. Say hi, Megan. Hi, Megan. Perfect. Outstanding. <laughs> uh, Patrick is a player in our main game and also played in the Halloween one-shot uh, that we will be discussing today. Say hi, Patrick. Hello. <laughs> Uh, so before we kind of dive into everything, I do want to make one quick announcement. Uh, the next episode of Into the Dungeon Main Game uh, will be live on November 17th at 12 p.m. So, Megan, um, mm -hmm. last Sunday, you mm -hmm. ran a one-shot for Into the Dungeon, mm -hmm. and it was incredible. Uh, wow. I spook very easily. Uh, would you mm -hmm. t take a, a, a few moments to tell us about that one shot? Um, so I tend to catalog like all whole information. So whenever I get the chance to make a one shot or a campaign, I like have it tucked away in like a, a filing cabinet somewhere to pull out. So I had kind of wanted to do a Halloween one shot. Um, I did one for a July, 4th of July one shot earlier this year for another group of friends and it was pretty fun. Um, and it kind of helps. I, I feel like the players get a little bit more creative with their characters because they're kind of seeing it as a mm -hmm. one shot character. So, uh, and of course, I love Halloween. I think a lot of people love Halloween. So it's just kind of nice to be able to do something fun with the holiday, but also like uh, share it with people. And like I said, I'll... I'll take information and kind of put it away in a filing cabinet and pull it back out and kind of like figure out how to get those pieces right. to fit together. And I think that's kind of like what a, a dungeon master kind of does too, where the players will put in their inputs and what they want. And then the DM has to kind of figure out how to make it work or make uh, that information um, or that possibility there for the characters, but I'm I'm the player and the DM, so it's like I want to see these things in the campaign, and then I figure out how to make it happen, mm -hmm. and hopefully people enjoy it. Right. Uh, you know, it, it, you made me think of something. So one of my favorite people on the planet is Colin Mockery, you know, from Improv mm -hmm. Fame, and he, there was an interview, and I'll see if I can link it if I could find it. Uh, but there's an interview he gives where he talks about some of his amazing long form puns that he became very well known for in the uh, um, oh shoot, what's the name of the show? The, the 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 big one. He's done a lot, but the big one. Whose line is it anyway? Whose yeah. line is it anyway? He became very famous for it. Whose line is it anyway? So he would be he was asked, you know, how do you do that? Because you know, so many people think improv. You're just going right off the top of your head, and the way he describes it is very akin to what you just said of having a filing cabinet that he has this repository of jokes, mm -hmm. and he he thumbs through them and pulls out what he needs, uh, and just drops it and makes us all laugh, and we all have a great time. And it's it's just interesting, because there's so much improvisation in D&D, &D, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then and then to, to hear you make that correlation. So there was so many spooky things in your one-shot <laughs> because of the Halloween nature of it. I feel mm -hmm. like we encountered nearly every major horror movie trope. <laughs> uh, was that intentional? Which one was the yeah. most fun for you to put together? 
and was the one that was the most fun for you to put together also the one that was the most fun for you to run yeah so i did i made a list i was like all right i so i sat at work and i always like jump ideas off of people because i don't think that my ideas are the best all the time and so like i'll bounce them off of people as like a soundboard I'm like hey what do you think of this and like oh yeah that's not a thing it's like okay i'm not crazy so i uh did that where i was like all right i want it's halloween theme so i want it to encompass everything that we perceive as having to do with Halloween. So um, like skeletons and graveyards and grave diggers and pumpkins and werewolves and witches and, um, you know, little devils or imps or um, uh, there's a couple of things that you guys didn't even get to. I was about to ask you about. Um, yeah, so I, you know, in every part of it, it was full of something. So, hmm. um, like in one of the rooms, because you never know, like, what the players are going to do. Like, some players might be super gung ho and, like, want to um, uh, go full speed ahead and just opening up every door and finding every creature. Um, and then there's some that are more cautious and not sure what they're supposed to do. Uh, hold on one sure, sure. second. Hey, uh, Patrick, uh, so you got yes. the chance to play a, a pretty interesting character. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what your motivation yeah, was for the, the character you chose to play, the race, the class, the name? Because uh, sure. I, I was... Qu- there was a lot to be enthralled with with that game from Megan's performances, all the cast performances, but I think yours was my favorite character, <laughs> even more so than mine. So talk, talk a little bit about him for me. Well, I assume sure. Well, thank you. Um, I was actually in my head just kind of uh, using it. Um, but for anyone who is able to watch the podcast, they will be introduced to the Torchbearer, <laughs> who is uh, going to remind you frequently that he does bear the torch. Now, what exactly <laughs> that means, I kind of didn't really flesh out too much. But the point was, and this is what I love about D&D, is I love being able to try anything that they put out. Any playtest content, any unearthed arcana that Wizards puts out, I'm going to read it, I'm going to look at it, and I'm going to think, how can I build a character? around that concept. So when the wildfire druid, the the circle of wildfire, uh, unearthed arcana, I think it's the latest, but it might be the the second newest um, one that came out. When that came out, I looked at it, I was reading it, and I was like, wow, this is an offensive druid. Uh, of course, we think well, <laughs> very offensive. <laughs> just in the oh. just in the fact that it's that it deviates so differently from the typical yeah. druid subclass. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You think druid? You think I'm gonna turn into a bear? I'm gonna turn into a giant ape or hyena? Circle of the moon? Circle of spores or creepy? Circle of shepherds? Circle of the land? I've never really seen played, but. I thought that the wildfire circle was different enough focusing on putting out fire damage, on being offensive, on having this little wildfire spirit familiar kind of thing going. Hmm. So I was playing the Torchbearer. He was, it was an Aarakocra druid. And I chose Aarakocra actually with the help of my girlfriend, Ashley, who was also playing. Hmm. Um, I was torn between Aarakocra and Fire Janazi for the mm. obvious reasons. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I was like, okay, Aarakocra, Flames, Phoenix. I didn't ah. play up the Phoenix aspect, aspect too much, but when I did cast Healing Spirit, I mm-hmm. made sure that that was the Phoenix. And do... Do I didn't even put that together first and foremost because I remember distinctly it being like the form of a phoenix. Um, but I, I, if I remember correctly, didn't you also ask if you saw anything phoenix feather or egg related in one of the chambers uh, mm-hmm. we were in? Yep, 
I was absolutely going to nick anything that my character would have thought was interesting. I, uh, I, I remembered I was stealing like small valuables because when reading on how to play an Aarakocra, something I had never done before, the avian mannerisms description talked about, you know, they don't recognize ownership, they want to decorate their nests, and I was like, I've got to include something <laughs> like that. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty funny. No, I enjoyed Patrick's character. The uh, the voice got a little hard, but I was like, maybe he has burnt uh, vocal cords. I've got to. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> oh, that must suck. I've never considered what it might be like to talk with like third degree burns on vocal cords before. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I hope um, that I never find out that that's a thing anybody has had to endure. I'm sure they have, but I don't want to hear mm -hmm. about it. Right, right. Oh, because it just because that just sounds like it'd be immensely painful. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But he he wasn't afraid. Or, I know I said it. He I'm kind of getting it mixed up myself, but the torchbearer wasn't afraid of death. He wasn't uh, really too concerned about where he was. And that was partly because I just wanted to focus on the concept, but partly at the same time that kind of did play into the personality of this creature. This creature that believes itself to, you're, he's, it's not a cleric, it's not a paladin, but it is still kind of devoted to this otherworldly power, this flame, this mm. phoenix, if you will. But yeah. Hmm. I did enjoy all the other characters we were playing with, uh, especially the changeling, uh, Rune, <laughs> by Ashley. Um I just I think everyone had the chance really to kind of explore something they hadn't played before. And I think that's always a a benefit to one shots. Something like the torchbearer, I don't really see working very well in a long form campaign. Mm -hmm. Um it's it's interesting, it's a concept to be played, but for me, at least the way I built the idea. It was good for a one shot and probably not much else. So on that note, uh, I really enjoyed the Torchbearer. Um, and I'm also running a long form game, as you are aware. It needs right. interesting NPCs. He it, it should absolutely show up at some point. OK, cool. Um, I have your consent it, it, for that. I appreciate that. Right, right, absolutely. And it should be an infuriating interaction, <laughs> not because he's annoying or 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 anything like that, but just mm -hmm. because he's it, the torchbearer. He, it's kind of not all there, you know. It, it's he's a bit of a bird brain. <laughs> what was his intelligence score? Do you recall? Um. So I actually had pretty average stats on him uh intelligence was probably a 12. okay that's 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 uh, uh... what i really played up was i got a six put it in strength and i figured the best way to represent that was even though eric kokra have a land speed of 25 feet per round i was actually moving him at about 15 feet per round just kind of hobbling along mm -hmm. so, so yours was six as well for strength Yes. I had a really good time playing Tilt, and very much like both of you have referenced, um, I probably would not have done this in a as a main character um, in, in a full game, but I made a Barbarian with a six strength, and all of his strength from being a Barbarian came from Gauntlets of Ogre strength. Uh, but it, it tickles me to know that I wasn't the only one with six strength in the party. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think at one point someone asked me to help with a physical task. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, well, I would, but I don't think I really can. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you mentioned the fact that we are running a long form game that uh, the next session will, of course, be on the 17th. So I do want to and there's certainly so much more to talk about with the, the Halloween one shot, but Justin, I did want to kind of talk with you a little bit more about kind of what the plans are for the, uh, 
the, the setup that we're going to be using for how you're going to evolve that setup. And also, I want to touch on something that maybe people who have viewed our streams haven't seen yet. And that is some of the really amazing terrain design and set design and some of the monster minis that you actually were able to bring to a previous campaign of yours that I, uh, that I was able to play with you. So I mm. wanted to see, do you have any plans to bring any of that back? Oh, I absolutely do. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for the shout out on that. I, I appreciate that you enjoyed the effort that went into some of those set pieces. Um, I, I do, uh, there's been such a focus on my part with taking on this, this new endeavor, uh, which is, you know, streaming our content and putting together a podcast with, with you all and the rest of our friends, you know, as we, you know, embark on this. And I was just talking to, uh, my wife the other day saying that I, I, I haven't had a chance to do the crafting. Uh, I have the next project I want to work on is a dice tower. I've got the stuff for it. Uh, I just haven't had a chance to. So the answer to you, the, 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 the short answer to your question is yes. You, there, there will be a return to using some custom set pieces. Uh, it's Excellent. just a little on the back burner at the moment. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. And, and recently I saw that I think it's Reaper Miniatures is doing a pretty large set of monster minis um, where you can kind of, I don't want to say buy them in bulk. I, I heard about this, but I haven't actually gone to look at it. But my understanding is it comes with somewhere in the range of like 100 miniatures. Um, hmm. And if that's hmm. true, I'll probably look to get it, but I'm going to need someone to paint it because I'm, I'm, I'm not... I, I can paint terrain, but that does not require the gentle hand that <laughs> miniature painting requires. I think when you said the words miniature painting, Creed's eyes just kind of like lit up. He doesn't really know why, but he <laughs> will. <clears throat> so Creed, um, I purchased a hundred and <laughs> maybe forty miniatures. Yeah, yeah, no, they're you not turn painted. Around. Yeah, yeah. You turn around and half of them are already painted. And he's like, yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> right. But I think that's going to be a great thing that we can bring into as Kazir, especially if we leave the town of Crossroads and maybe start exploring more of this diverse continent that is really at our beck and call. I mean, we could go anywhere and do anything. So it's going to be really fun kind of seeing what we can what kind of trouble we can get into and what kind of crazy exotic locales that we can be getting that trouble into. Um, do you think it will be possible that once we do start using minis, start using set designs, that we'll be able to include a camera that is maybe focused on a battle map? So, yes. Um, I, I would, even if we don't immediately introduce the 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 nicer set pieces and the custom handmade set pieces i still want to get us to that because we do use at the very least a standard battle grid and i think it adds something when you can see what's happening as a viewer i know it does for me when i sit down and look at other streams oh yeah the the limitation there is more hardware than it is anything else um, what I've learned in doing this process is that you can't just hook two even, uh, or three or four or five for that matter. Uh, you can't hook more than one USB webcam to a single USB controller. So if you're looking at the back of your computer and you see a row of four USB ports and they're all connected to the same relative spot on the motherboard, that's considered a controller. And... If you have eight USB ports, but only two controllers, you're only using two cameras. So fortunately, mm -hmm. I think, not for not, not I think, fortunately I have four controllers. I have all okay. four of them tapped out. Um, so I really like that we have a dice cam. If, as we play, we may change that to be in a position where you can also see the field or, you know, maybe it's one of the players at the table twists it and now it's looking at that.
But I think we really add something kind of nice when our viewers can watch the stream and know that the DM is not changing dice rolls. Sure. And so I really like that. And I think it sets us apart because I have not seen another stream do that. Um, so that that's kind of why I'm leaning towards sticking with that one. But I'm not married to it, and I certainly am interested to hear what you know our viewers think about it as we start to actually have a viewership and people start interacting. Absolutely. I want to real quickly deviate. Um, I, I promised at the beginning of this, or I recommended at the beginning of this, that because we're new at this and we're getting better at it, we shouldn't look at the chat. We should just focus on what we're doing. Uh, I couldn't resist and I looked at the chat. We have one viewer. I I don't know who the viewer is. The viewer's name is Amarok42000 and he linked the Reaper Kickstarter that I was mentioning. Cool. So it is cool. a Kickstarter that's live on uh or it, it's a it's a Kickstarter campaign that's live right now. Uh it is by Reaper and I'm skimming it real quickly just to kind of see if I can tell what it is. But it looks like for $120, you get a ton of miniatures, all of them unique. Some large, some small, some monstrous, some NPC, some props. There's a ton of them. So I'm kind of eyeballing that. And since I have a link for it, I will post it in the show notes for if anybody is interested. Because Reaper makes really good stuff. Well, cool. very cool. Uh, similarly, the uh, Kickstarter for Skinny Minis ended recently, and I'm very excited to see uh, what they'll actually look like once they arrive. That'll be a, an April, May kind of thing, but that's going to be very nice. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, the campaign is actually already concluded. There, It is only open to what Kickstarter calls late backers. I don't know how late backers work. That that last time I backed a Kickstarter, late backers was not a thing. So, gotcha. Quick addendum. Well, I do. Uh, there's so many other questions I actually have about the Halloween one shot. So I kind of want to move away from you, Dustin. I understand. And go back to Megan, because uh, there's just a couple of things that I wanted to touch on. I think the first thing is that you were able to bring out all of these classic horror movie tropes, like Justin mm -hmm. said. And we kept running into them. We kept walking into them. I think we stumbled into a couple. But we actually only really fought, if I remember, two creatures to mm -hmm. the end. So what were your kind of thoughts about you had all these cool monsters ready to throw at us, but we ended up just kind of talking to them and befriending <laughs> them in some cases were you were you frustrated about that or were you thinking all right this is this is okay yeah the awakened and... mind that ashley you <laughs> definitely threw me for a loop i wasn't expecting that uh yep. but i mean there are like the you know and i gave you guys like level three you had a feat you had one magic item anything that wasn't rare even if you came up with the idea of making your own because you didn't find one that worked for your player, I was cool with that because doing a one shot, it's I didn't want to limit myself on what I introduced to you guys because I didn't want to just like, oh, here's a rat because you're level one. Um, so, but I also find that the higher the level is, the harder it is to keep up um, with all of the things a, a, a character can do um so especially if you're doing a one shot so i was like okay level three is pretty good but kind of bolster you a little bit a feat and a magical item um and while her hers was just uh, a trait it wasn't a magical item or anything that kind of I think that's also part of the um, challenge of a DM is sometimes characters will do something you weren't expecting. And then it kind of just comes like, all right, well, <laughs> this is not challenging anymore because you guys can just talk to these creatures. But looking back, Awakened Mind is, I you know, not knowing how it works versus how we used it, there might be some discrepancy. Um, yeah. But uh, it was fun. So Justin cool. asked about like the characters that uh, I made. My favorite was the werewolf. 
were you really hoping we'd fight the werewolf? I I wasn't he wasn't one that I had designed for you guys to fight. So, you know, I had set the map up. You could go left or right. And, you know, I was kind of hoping you guys would go towards the um graveyard. Cause who doesn't love a graveyard? Um yeah, I'm... Oh, sorry. No, but no, it's fine. Uh, but because I've never fought an Oni or played with an Oni before in a game, and I've this isn't the only campaign that I've designed to have Onis in it. So for some reason, I just like these creatures. So is Oni like basically your white whale at this point that you keep throwing them <laughs> in, hoping people will let you use them, and you just never get to? Kind, kind of, yeah. <laughs> I just like the a magical ogre mm -hmm. and it, he's just like the to me one of the creepiest humanoid creatures and not like creepy because he's like I just feel like their nature is creepy like there's some like dandy creatures that are designed to look creepy and it's just uh, something about him it's just like horror movie creepy without it being so supernatural when you were running the one shot and you had all these monsters ready to go and everything, mm -hmm. what would you say kind of surprised you the most about how the one shot went? And you can't just say Rune having awakened mind because she made a deal with Cthulhu. Yeah. Kathy Lou. <laughs> Kathy Lou. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what surprised me the most was I guess I wasn't expecting to have to push you guys so much. So I guess, you know, and I guess it, it might come from like watching D&D &D games versus playing D&D &D games. Because I think there's so much out there now we tend to watch more than we do to play. So those always are, I guess it's, I don't know what it's kind of like, I guess has an effect on the mind where it's like you're expecting it to constantly be moving yeah and the and the players add to that but then again it's like well the dm sets it up a certain way or there's you some behind the scenes thing that keep things moving or something like that so well it was yeah i gotta tell you, gotta tell you. Mm -hmm. creed is going to hear this and hear you say that you didn't expect to have to push us so much <laughs> and he's not going to let that go because <laughs> of how much he had to push us in the yeah. last game. Yeah. Um, but I definitely. think that, you know, and I might touch on this a little bit later too, is that one of the things I feel like stops people when they're playing, um, is uh like they it's almost like a paralysis when you know the rules it paralyzes your thoughts um so like one of my favorite games that i've watched i've recommended was um acquisitions incorporated c team because jerry holkins the dm is like this is and the players will say i don't think i can do this and he's like this is D D. like this isn't you know MF Dungeons and Dragons, you know, you can do whatever you want, play the game. Right. And I think that knowing the rules paralyzes the players. And I, I've noticed that a first time player versus a, a veteran, they tend to have, and I've experienced it with doing one shots, is that one shots, people tend to be more creative. And I don't, you know, ask you, Patrick, and it's like, do you feel like you're able to take more liberties with your character in a one-shot campaign? And why not bring that fun to a full-time campaign? Because you have your torchbearer. It's like he's like, oh, I might not bring that into like a full campaign. It's like, but why not? What what holds you back? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and and definitely when it comes to that kind of like paralysis, even in combat, out of combat, I there was a moment I remember this vividly where it was my turn mm -hmm. and the minutes were just ticking by. I felt like someone needed to pull out a timer because I was like, I have 
no idea what to do mm-hmm. but yeah i definitely know what you uh, definitely see what you're saying and and for a one shot for some uh, a character like the torchbearer it was it was definitely a there's going to be a theme to the one shot there's going to be a a kind of experience that we're all coming into and maybe your general hey i'm gonna go play in D D with some friends and start a campaign for a year maybe that kind of character you build for that won't um won't really translate all that well to a more specific one shot mm-hmm. um but it was an opportunity to kind of experience and play a character that in my mind I wouldn't want to be the torchbearer in a campaign because I couldn't really figure out what kind of motivations he might have. What would draw a creature like the torchbearer to journey across a continent with six or seven strangers and help them achieve their personal goals? That's, that's a tough question that I was like, you know what? I'm glad I don't have to answer this. I can just be there and have fun. Um, Alternatively, in Justin's long-term game, the main game, uh, in, in Azkazir, I'm playing a character, Sandro Durand, that I feel like I have a lot of opportunity to both grow as a character, but also grow with the rest of the group in a manner that will help the group achieve their goals, bring characters together, maybe introduce a little unexpected drama now and then, but certainly... I approach them both with a different kind of design philosophy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Justin, you like as a a player, do you you know, everybody enjoys a, a nice long campaign, but I always find somehow a one shot is um just I don't know, I just find it more fun. So as like a dm also as a player you see like some pros and cons like introducing a one shot um like because there's certain things like i expect from a full campaign i actually haven't really played many one shots i think i've only played like one so i somehow it's like the bridesmaid never the bride as like I, i i run the one shots i don't play them so what are some things that you expect out of like a one shot Mm. well before i answer that question i want to address something that you and patrick brought up a second ago uh regarding the the ability to just kind of run in in a one shot and have a good time and maybe not have some of the anxiety over character loss as you experiment in a one shot uh, it, mm-hmm. I, I like to think that when you compare me back to like when I first started playing to now, I'm much less hesitant than I was before. However, mm-hmm. I scare very easily. As an example, <laughs> I don't remember the last time I sat down and watched a horror movie. So when you <laughs> put me in a one shot environment where like you described a tree with a hole underneath it and I immediately mm-hmm. assumed that was a mouth. And if I got anywhere near this water, I was going to be devoured. Little did I know that was actually the home of some fucking bone dragon. Right. Sorry, I get scared. Excuse the F-bomb. But I was scared, okay? Because mm-hmm. <laughs> Halloween gets me like that. Where we're entering into a much more jolly time. Um, but no, to, to address your, your question, though... Uh, I, I kind of look at it the way you look at your encounters you talked about earlier in the way of filing away uh, scenarios. Mm-hmm. I, I do the same thing. I, I have dozens of one shots that I've either thought up or borrowed. Um, it, or there's a subreddit called uh, Behind the Screen that has wonderfully talented people. And some of those one shots are just absolutely incredible. Um, I wish I, I'll link it in the show notes, but there was one that I ran in the last game that I integrated it in to the story, but it was just a one shot. And it was this uh, great sheep chase. 
and and by the end of the great sheep chase you're fighting a bed dragon like literally yep. a bed mm. polymorphed into a dragon and those things mm. are zany and they're fun and they're amazing um so i like to take those one shots and i have them in a repository of okay in this part of this continent in this full campaign this little one shot lives there and this little oh. one shot lives here and things of that nature um i think that there is not necessarily more work that's involved in planning a full campaign than there is a one shot i think it's a different type of work Mm. Um, uh, in its, um, so I try to integrate them in and that way I kind of feel like I'm maximizing my prep time. I've prepped the one shot. I've prepped the full campaign as a backdrop. You know, I know what's going on in the full campaign. Now I can mm -hmm. just kind of plug one shots here and one shots there and, mm -hmm. you know, town with interesting, you know, characters here and hopefully, as the players and their characters naturally explore, I can just go, you know, grab off the metaphorical shelf the one shot and, you know, be done. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, with a, a full campaign versus a one shot, there is, seems, to, there's like a weight uh associated with a full campaign versus a one shot where it's like a lot of the players are like i'll pick a character that might not be great for um a, a long campaign but it'll be fun to play in a short you know one shot i think the same thing happens for the dm where it's like yeah this will be fun to do in a one shot somebody dies it's like oh well you know nobody's feelings are hurt Versus a full campaign where there's a lot of uh, value given to not only like the story, but the characters and, you know, kind of what the, the personal attachment that a character gets. Do you ever feel like that affects you as a DM, like that, that weight? Yes, definitely. Um, but you have to, or at least I feel like you have to kind of balance that with some realism as well. You know, I, I mm -hmm. hate the notion here, before I say that, I love the notion that <laughs> a player's character could die in a way that is fair and heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if we weren't streaming it to an audience, the seven or eight of us at the table feel that connection. I, I describe D&D &D as deeply intimate. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if only, even if it's one shots, even if you're meeting once a month to play one shots, you're likely meeting with the same group of people. You're likely mm -hmm. meeting for months, years at a time. These people are your family. And mm -hmm. that translates into character. So that being said, in order for a character to draw that kind of a response, they have to be around long enough for people to latch on. So I mm -hmm. hate the notion of killing a character too early, but in 5th edition especially, early is when you're most likely to kill somebody, especially by accident. <laughs> oh, yeah. it, it exponentially gets harder to kill somebody. And, and that's the other thing. You obviously are never trying to kill people, but I try to put on my villain goggles when I'm playing the villain in the moment. What mm -hmm. would this villain do? You know, is this villain going to make the killing blow? Does the villain feel, you know, is the person bleeding out at zero hit points, making death saves at their feet? And they could mm -hmm. easily, you know, kill them right then and there. But there's a wizard across the way firing firebolts at them. Mm -hmm. you, maybe that villain realistically is going to handle the immediate threat as opposed to proving a point. Um, so I try to handle those in realistic ways. But sometimes it happens and then you don't get that chance. And that sucks to your point because you're talking about respecting what that player hopes to do with that character. And, you know, squashing mm -hmm. out a life before it has a chance to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely that player, though, that gets fully invested in my characters. And I've had 
one character die on me, and I still obsess about it. <laughs> Do you, I, so I obsess about that character. It, I, it, I play the scenarios in my head of how it could have gone what more in my done? favor. <laughs> wow. So because I am your DM for the mm -hmm. Azkazir game, and for those that don't know, that's that that is what we keep referring to as the main game. Mm -hmm. When you find yourself replaying that and and wondering what you could have done, do you feel like that death was do you do you hold ill will towards the DM that rolled those dice? Oh yes. no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no. A friend of mine, um, she had played one, cause she, so she had introduced me to D and D. Her and her, uh, her husband, and both Greg and I to D and D. And so we played with them at that point about two and a half years. So a very, um, you know, close with them and everything. And I, I, it was a, it was one of those characters where it was personality was pretty crappy but i loved playing that character um and i i bear her no ill will for what happened because in a sense it i did it to myself i did two very distinct things that just sunk my ship wow. like i was digging my grave and i just kept going deeper and deeper <laughs> so it was it was have to get that but, full story in a future episode. I, I'm yeah. really oh, curious man. as to what I happened. I love that character. So, um, but, and I, and I feel, but that's also part of playing your character. It's like, well, do you play in, against your character in a way, against your character's personality just to save them? Or is this a character that would dig their own grave? And it was a character that would dig her own grave. So, yeah. um, just out of spite. Because that was the type of, because <laughs> that was the kind of personality she had. So, no, but I mean that character could have been a great villain. Oh wow! And that's why I regret is not making her the villain. Okay, well I think that's going to draw us to a close for this episode of <laughs> Dungeon Chat. Uh, thank you both so very much for making the time to be on here and and chatting with me about our last session and some of what we're doing here and into the dungeon. Uh, for mm -hmm. those of you listening right now, at the very least, the one of you, thank you so very much. Um, we've had internal discussions about what it might look like in the future to support what we're doing, and I will tell you right now, our focus is on producing content, and if you really, really like it, I'd ask that you share it, tell your friends about it, follow us. Uh, the social media platforms will be listed in the show notes for the podcast and right now on the Twitch if you're looking at the screen or if you're looking at the, the replay if, we, if you find yourself back here. The next game will be the 17th of this month. We start at 12 Eastern Time and run till about 6 o'clock. But uh, oh. thank you all very much and we'll see you next time as we go into the dungeon.